Hey guys, we're going to continue our look at the great vision of our exalted Lord in glory. The look we started last week, and this is in Revelation 1. So let's go ahead and read that. Revelation 1, 12 through 20. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So what did we see last week? So far we've seen Christ is with his church, he prays for his church, he purifies his church, and he speaks to his church with authority. Well, let's pick up the vision again now in verse 16. And this is Christ controls his church. Look at verse 16. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Revelation 120 says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Colossians 1.18 says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So we are to get our orders from him. We are to submit to him. And it goes on and it says the angels of the seven churches are held in his right hand. Now, right hand speaks of control. So whoever the angels of the church are that are in his right hand, he is controlling them. Now, angels is the Greek word angelos. It's a common word for angels, but it is also used for messengers. Now, since the New Testament never teaches that angels are leaders of the church, it is probably best to consider this to be messengers, leaders that represent the churches. And this shows the high function of spiritual leaders in the church, doesn't it? They are to be able to hear from Christ, and they are to be controlled by Christ. Then, as under shepherds, they mediate his rule. This is why the standards of New Testament leadership are so high. These leaders must be in a spiritual state where they can hear Jesus and be guided by him. Well, let's move on to the next element in this great vision, and that is Christ disciplines his church. Look at Revelation 1.16 again. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Well, this is obviously not saying that Jesus has a literal sword coming out of his mouth. Ephesians 6.17 tells us what the sword is. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So this verse is speaking about the power of the Word of God when Jesus speaks it. And this word can be used as an instrument to build people up, but also as an instrument of judgment. Revelation 19.15 says, From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. But here it is referring to God's judgment against his enemies that are within the church. Revelation 2.12 says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Revelation 2.16 says, Therefore repent, if not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. And so the word will expose the sin of those who are rebelling against God in the church, and if they don't repent, the word will be used to discipline them. And in John 12, 48, we see the word being used as an instrument of judgment. Look at John 12, 48. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. Now, who is that judge? It says, the word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. At the judgment, the unbeliever will be confronted with every bit of scripture he has ever heard or read. And this is serious because one of the principles of judgment is this. We will be judged according to the light we have had. And so there are some that sit in church for years and they're exposed to the light. They're exposed to the truth. 
but they never respond to that truth they're hearing. They feel they're fine just because they're in church. So they see no need of faith in Christ and no need to repent from sin. But listen, all those scriptures they heard and rejected will be used to determine the degree of their judgment. The very word they rejected will rise up to judge them. So what have we seen going back to last week? Christ is present with his church. He prays for his church. He purifies his church. He speaks to his church. He controls his church and he disciplines his church. Well, let's move to the next part of the vision. Christ's glory is seen in his church. Look at Revelation 1.16 again. His face was like the sun shining in full strength. So John's vision of the risen Lord ends with this description of radiant glory. And it's amazing, like the sun shining in full strength. And this shows us that he is the one who is supposed to be shining in the church, right? Listen, it's not the pastor. The pastor is a mere reflection of his glory, like all of us. We are all to reflect the glory of our Lord. And leaders need to be careful not to steal the glory that belongs only to him, right? They must be careful that they don't make every story about them where they're always being the hero. Some ministries center so much around the pastor, you hear more about him than Jesus. And that's just not right. So the pastor must not be the center of attention. He must not be the superstar. He must fight against that, and the congregation must stop making the pastor more than he is. Yes, he's been called to lead that church, but he's just another man. He is not Jesus Christ, and don't turn him into an idol. One writer said this. I love these words. He says, what do you see in Christ's right hand? Seven stars. Yet how insignificant they appear when you get a sight of his face. They are stars, and there are seven of them, but who can see seven stars are 70,000 stars when the sun is shining in its full strength. How sweet it is when the Lord himself is so present in a congregation that the preacher, whoever he may be, is altogether forgotten. I pray you, dear friends, when you go to a place of worship, always try to see the Lord's face rather than the stars in his hand. Look at the sun, and you will forget the stars. Well, amen to that, right? The pastor's job, and let me add the worship group's job also, is to point people to Jesus Christ. He is the only star in the church. And let's stick with this a bit, because it is so important. This stealing of the glory can really be a danger to those who are successful in ministry, can it? I mean, success is dangerous. It's better than failure, right? But still, it's dangerous. And it is so easy to start believing the headlines, to start enjoying the compliments a little too much, to start thinking you're irreplaceable. I mean, what would they do without me? Well, listen, the only reason you've been successful is because God was moving through you. So without you, they'd still have God. And so you know what? They're good. Now, a great example of the danger of success stroking your ego is King Uzziah in 2 Chronicles 26. God blessed him greatly while he was seeking him. He was successful militarily. He defeated the enemies on every side of Israel. He was secure and joined a large, well-trained army. He was gifted with a brilliant mind. He invented effective weaponry for the military. So everything was going great for Uzziah. And his fame started to spread. And the scriptures point out why he was so blessed. Second Chronicles 26, 15, his fame spread far and wide, for he was greatly helped. But look at what it adds, until he became powerful. He became powerful. He started to enjoy the fame, and he started to enjoy the compliments, and he forgot why he was blessed and started patting himself on the back. Second Chronicles 26, 16, But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. You know what he did? He went into the temple to burn incense. That was something only the priest was to do. But you know, the whole pride thing, he probably thought, you know, nobody can burn incense like me. And the Lord struck him down with leprosy. And the tragic ending of Uzziah is found in 2 Chronicles 26, 21. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous, and excluded from the temple of the Lord. 
his blessings came to a screeching halt. Now, I've been around long enough in the Christian body to see this happen to pastors. They get proud, they forget all their blessings linked directly to the Lord, and they begin to exalt themselves. And I have watched the Lord remove his glory from their life. And it is tragic and it is heartbreaking. So much wasted potential. Listen, if the Lord is using you, please be careful to remember who gets the glory. There is only one superstar in this story, and it's not you. Every leader, every worship leader must become skilled at pointing people away from self and to Jesus. So now we move into the effects of the vision. Read Revelation 1, 17 through 19. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. So the first effect is absolute fear. Verse 17 again, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Charles Wendall wrote these interesting words. He said, in a brief glimpse of unveiled deity shrouded in mysterious symbols, the beloved disciple quickly learned his place in the universe. St. John, evangelist, theologian, elder, apostle, and elite member of Christ's inner circle, was instantly reduced to a trembling sinner lying powerless before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In a word, he was terrified. Now, John was very familiar with Christ on earth, right? He reclined upon him in the upper room at the Last Supper. I mean, he was intimate with the Lord, familiar with the Lord. But when he saw the glorified Christ on Patmos, he didn't go up and shake hands. He didn't go up and say, give me five, bro. He didn't pat him on the back. He didn't start a conversation. Hey, great to see you, man. How you been? You're looking good, all shiny and everything. No, his reaction was simple. He fell at his feet as though dead, paralyzed. Now, this makes you have to question those who say they have met Jesus face to face. One false prophet had a vision of Jesus while he was shaving. You know what? He just continued to shave and talk. Others speak of hugging Jesus, sitting on his lap, talking things over with him, asking questions about those things that have been bothering them. You know, just chatting. But what does the Bible tell us when people have a heavenly vision? Well, look at Daniel's response when he saw an angel, not even the creator of the angel. Daniel 10, 8. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. He was weak. He was helpless. It says he was sick for days, and that was over an angel. But when John saw Jesus, he wasn't just sick. He was paralyzed. That's what happens when people see Christ. Saul and his companions saw just the glow of the risen Lord. They lost all their strength and fell prostrate in the road. And look at the response of those who see Jesus in glory in Revelation. Revelation 6, 16 and 17, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? So John collapses under the weight of holy glory. But notice Jesus' response. And here we have absolute fear met by divine comfort. Verse 17 and 18, we have divine assurance. Look at that again, verse 17 and 18. He laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Well, this is the same thing that happened at the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw Jesus in his glorified body, speaking with Moses and Elijah, and watch what happens. Matthew 17, 5 through 7. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. So when we are afraid, he is a God. He is the good shepherd who comes to comfort us. This is a regular pattern in the scriptures, right? You see that over and over again, where Jesus comes to assure his followers, telling them to fear not, 
take heart, don't be afraid. In other words, the one standing in the midst of the lampstands stands with us. We see this when Paul was on trial before Caesar. 2 Timothy 4, 16 and 17 says, At my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. So Paul says, When I had to stand before Caesar and defend myself, no one came to my aid. No one spoke up for me. Everybody deserted me. But Jesus didn't leave Paul alone. He went and comforted him. Now, I doubt that was anything visible. Usually he comes to us, he fills us with his peace and strength, and suddenly we're different, right? We were afraid, we were worried, but suddenly we're different. We're lifted. That's because Jesus has stood by us. He has helped us. Now, I've had this kind of experience many times. I'll never forget when I was arrested in Vietnam for smuggling Bibles. In my earlier days, I smuggled Bibles into a lot of communist countries. But Vietnam was one of the scariest places that I'd ever gone to because the State Department report said this, for illegal religious activity, you would be arrested and just disappear into the system and nobody would know where you are. And so we landed in Saigon, which is Ho Chi Minh City now. I picked up my bags off the carousel and I went to customs and they started to open my bags. And I was praying, Lord, don't let them see all the Bibles in there. But you know what they did? And I was arrested. What happened was I was taken into a back room. There were soldiers there with rifles, and they started to interrogate me, and they were trying to intimidate me. But the Lord stood by me. Suddenly, I was filled with peace and boldness, and I started to witness. And you know, I was thinking, shut up, Bill, shut up. But I didn't shut up. It was like Jeremiah, who said God's words welled up in him, and he couldn't keep his mouth closed. That's what I felt like. And so I'm witnessing to these guys with their guns who were trying to intimidate me. I wasn't afraid at all any longer. And you know what? It just kind of freaked them out. Finally, they just looked at me and said, get out of here. They pointed to the door and let me go. And I found myself standing outside the airport, not charged with anything. And I just said, thank you, Lord, so much. So Jesus goes to John to comfort him. But notice what the comfort is based upon. It's all based on who he is. And isn't this what the persecuted church needs to see? Jesus in his glorified state that he wants to help them and that he can help them because of who he is. This is what we need in times of trouble. To know our God is for us, that he stands with us, and then to know that he is able to help us so that we can rest in his ability. So the first thing he points out is this. He is the great I am. Look at Revelation 1.17. He laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am. Now this is the covenant name of God that we first hear in Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And this is the name Jesus took to himself in John 8 when being confronted by the Jewish leaders. John 8.58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. In other words, the one you're talking to is the great I am. I am the one who spoke to Moses in that burning bush. Now, do you think they got what he was saying? Well, look at the next verse, John 8, 59. So they picked up stones to throw at him. They knew exactly what he was saying, and they were going to stone him for blasphemy. This is the name he also used to comfort the frightened disciples who saw him walking on the water. Matthew 14, 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Now we lose a lot in that English translation. The Greek is very clear. Let me try to say the Greek for you. Tarseo, ego, eimi, me fabeo. In other words, that is saying, Be of good courage, I am, that's all, I am, not fear. Ego eimi, I am. Same words he uses here in verse 17. The point is he stoops to comfort John. He says, take heart. And here is why my comfort means something. Because of who I am. I am the great I am. Then he continues. He is the eternal God. Revelation 117. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last. 
Jesus is the great I am, and the great I am is the eternal God. First and last, another title for God in the Old Testament, the one without beginning or end. Now, what a truth to the persecuted church that lived under the threat of death. The one who loves you, the one who stoops down to help you, his help isn't temporary. It lasts for all of eternity. So trust him, live for him. It is going to be so worth it. Soon you will step into eternity to be with him and your joy will never end. The blessings will never end. The rewards you will be given because of your faithfulness will never end. The temporal pain will turn into eternal reward and blessing. It is worth it. Hang on. Trust him. But how do I know I'll be with him forever? I mean, it's great, isn't it, that he is eternal and his blessings and rewards are eternal. But what if I don't get there? What if I don't end up with him? Well, that is covered in the next thought. He is the one who conquered death. Verse 17 and 18 again. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. He is the one who conquered death once and for all. Now, what a truth to those facing the threat of death from persecution. He says, I have taken the sting of death away. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Death for the unbeliever is a horrifying thought, isn't it? It's shrouded in mystery. I mean, what will happen to me? Is it an eternal nothing? Or worse, will I stand before a holy God and be sent to hell? The unbeliever doesn't want to talk about death at all. They don't want to think about death. It's just too morbid, isn't it? But death for the believer is not a disaster. It's not a mystery. We know it is the upgrade, the entrance to real life, because he conquered death in him. So will we. John 11:25 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Listen, those who die in him don't really die because that is when life really begins. That is when unending joy and peace that can't be shaken starts. Now, have you ever felt the presence of God? Well, it's good, isn't it? It's amazing. But listen, brothers and sisters, you're going to be bathed in the presence of God continuously. Revelation 21, 23, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. You are going to be bathed in the glory of God for all of eternity. Spurgeon said, I have a strong appetite for heaven. All I can say to that is, Amen. Now, he adds to this thought of assurance in the next statement, Revelation 118, And I have the keys of death and Hades. Now, keys speak of access and authority. Let's look at Jesus' authority first. Jesus has complete authority over death, down to the minute we die. Psalm 139, 16 says, Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Job 14, 5, now listen to this. You have decided the length of our lives. You know how many months we will live, and we are not given a minute longer. Again, what a truth to a persecuted church living under man's threat of death. Jesus says, man doesn't have authority over you. They don't determine when you die. God does. God's way of bringing you home may come through man, but listen, it's not up to man. Man can't shorten your life one minute unless that is a part of God's plan. Well, let's look at the keys. Keys not only open doors, they lock doors, don't they? Listen, when Jesus died for you, he locked the door of Hades, the place of the dead, the place of punishment. So when we die, hell is not a threat. Jesus has locked that door. So he has authority when we die. He's chosen the perfect day and the perfect way, and I trust him for that. In his perfect wisdom, he never makes a mistake in how he plans for my life. I may not go the way I want to. Listen, I want to die in my sleep. I want it to be painless, and I want it to be easy. But he may plan for me to die as a martyr. Listen, that is up to him. He knows what is best. 
He never makes a mistake in his planning. So he has authority when and how I die, and he has authority over where I go when I die. I go to be with him. The door to hell is locked for me. Now, one more quickly. This is John's commissioning. Revelation 119. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. Well, we saw last week that this is the outline of the book. The things you have seen. That's the vision of chapter 1. The things that are. That's the present age, the church age. That's chapters 2 through 3. And then the things that will be the prophecies in the rest of this book. And so John is commissioned to write all this in a book. Now, I want to end with this, friend. Do you know him? I mean, we've talked about his greatness, the great I am, and the eternal God without beginning and end. I mean, it's wonderful to see all this about him, isn't it? But listen, the big question is this. Do you know him? And maybe he is reaching out to you right now through this study. And the offer he is making you is amazing. He is giving you a chance to change your eternal destiny. He is offering an escape from hell. He has made heaven available. But again, you must know him. But fortunately, he's made that very easy. Like the tax collector in Luke, listen, you simply need to cry out to him. Simply need to say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me. I believe that all who place their trust in your son will be saved. So I do that right now. Lord, save me. Rescue me. Make me your child. Help me to turn from my sins and live for you. In Jesus' name. Friend, if you will do that, you will be received into God's family. And your eternal resonance will change from hell to heaven. Well, that's the end of our study. God bless you guys. Hit those buttons down below, subscription, like, notification bell. That helps us with the algorithms. And uh, I'll see you next week. And we pick up chapter two. I'm really excited about that as we start the seven churches of Revelation. God bless you guys.